and welcome to another episode of Morning in the Workshop. I am Krista West, and this episode today is sponsored by the Calvin Institute for Christian Worship by a grant from them and the Liturgical Arts Academy. As many of you know, due to coronavirus, uh, we the Liturgical Arts Academy, which was scheduled to happen in May, had to be canceled. And so all of us instructors have put together different content. And I actually think this is a great thing because it's allowing me to give you a little bit more behind the scenes tour of the workshop and of the making of Orthodox Christian Vestments. So in today's episode, I am going to show you how I make a set of priest cuffs, either priests, deacons, and bishops all wear the cuffs, um, known as epimonikia in Greek. This is not, very clearly not, a how-to video, just to be very clear on that. I actually don't think that deacons and priest vestments are something that the um, parish or amateur seamstress should take on. They require a lot of fitting and measuring and tailoring that happens way before we even get to the machine here. But I know that people are really curious about how exactly vestments are made. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is I'm just going to walk you through the process so you can kind of see what happens to the inside of vestments to make them vestments. So I'm going to start with the cuffs. Um, what we're actually making today is this. It's a fully traditional set of cuffs. They come in pairs and they are laced through the back. Um, in the ancient world, uh, things like rings and cord were used. Uh, Velcro hadn't been invented. Zippers hadn't been invented. None of that had been invented. So pretty much most clothing fasteners on vestments are very traditional. Buttons and loops. Um, sometimes in the modern age, we'll use a hook and eye, but even that's a very modern adaptation. But this is a cuff and ring um, arrangement. Okay. And I'll actually unwrap it so you can see what it looks like. And so let's see here. This actually is a stair-stepped cording so that when it's actually put on the priest's cuffs, it just closes very quickly and easily for him. It has a cross on the front. It's finished with galoon. It's fully lined and it has a canvas interfacing. So I'm going to walk you through how we do this. Now, I've already done some of the prep work, but prep work ahead of time because it would be very boring for you to sit here and watch me sewing on rings. But I'll at least sew like the last ring on to show you what I'm doing. I have canvas. I've started with canvas. This is the really important inside of the vestments is actual tail. It's actually marine canvas. It's what's used to make great big boat covers. So if any of you have ever been on a harbor and gone down and seen those enormous yachts and things like that, and they have those huge boat covers on them, this is the kind of fabric. This is what I've used for 25 years. The reason I use th this as an interfacing is because modern interfacings that you can buy at the fabric store, um, things like fusible interfacings, woven interfacings, are only designed for the garment industry. And the garment industry typically designs for an 18 month or less lifespan of the garment. So what that means is after 18 months, that interfacing starts breaking down. And what happens is when an interfacing breaks down, it really affects the brocade and the linings and everything gets really squishy and weird. And so early on when I was training, I learned to use the canvas because the canvas is incredibly durable. It will actually outlast the vestments. It's not uncommon 20 years down the road when a priest is wearing cuffs and he's worn them frequently over 20 years for you to actually see the fabric to start wearing away and you see the canvas edge coming through. So with this canvas, I took two layers and I pad stitched them. Actually, here's the other one. I'll show you. I actually put them together usually like this and I pad stitch them, which means I stitch every quarter of an inch around and around and around and around. If you can see that in there, that holds the two layers of canvas together. If I didn't do that, it would shift, and then you would get this these weird pockets of bunched up canvas in the cuff. So the pad stitching is critical. We use pad stitching on cuffs, on zonies, and on epigonatia. And the basic technique that I'm using right now, with the exception of sewing on the rings, is very similar to what we use for zoni and for epigonatia. Now, for epitrahelion, it's a single layer of canvas, and so there isn't any pad stitching. That's a little bit different but we're gonna keep doing the cuffs. So I've already sewn on this side of the rings and you'll notice that one side has four rings and one side has three. And that's so that when it turns and you wrap it together, the rings will be alternating. Now I'll put this last one on. I use um, Guterman top stitching thread. 
That's my favorite top stitching thread because it has to be really durable. And then I've got positioning marks on my canvas. And this piece of Guterman thread has been really giving me fits today. Okay, and then I'm gonna come through the canvas and I'm gonna set the rings. I actually have my rings custom made for me. They're brass. Um, they're just like little plated brass rings because it's really easy to get cheap rings and cheap rings will break. Um, there's, there's a lot of stories out there of where someone has gotten ordained and literally as the bishop is putting the cuffs on him, that the rings go pop, 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 and like pop out of the cuffs. And you just don't really want to have that happen. Okay, so now I'm sewing this ring on like this. And I'm going to go through it three times with a double layer of top stitching thread. That way I know that it is really, really secure. I am also going to now come through the last pass and I'm going to knot this on the front. And the reason I'm knotting this on the front, because that tends to kind of break, those of you who do so know that that's like, they're, you're probably sitting there going, that's weird. The reason we do that is because we don't want there to be a knot on the back side where the lining is, where you would be feeling that on your arm. So we knot them to the front because this will be hidden under a balloon. Okay, I'm going to trim that. Okay, so I have my cuff ready to go. I am now going to take my... I'm going to take, and actually, I'm going to do this right here. I can do this right here. Let me grab my stapler and my ruler. Okay. I am going to start by positioning the center motif, because in a minute, I'm going to sew this cross in here. But you don't want to have this to where it's like positioned off like this or crooked or anything like that. So you have to position this, and I'm going to start by finding the center point of here and double checking that it's the same on both. Oh, and I'm a little smidge off, just like a 16th of an inch. So I'll go in a little tighter and I'll check it. I'm like, okay, I'm good this way. Now I'm gonna also check it this way. And I'm gonna make sure I'm at the same point. And again, I'm off just, just a hair. And I'm gonna position that that way, good. And then here I'm perfect. Now I'm gonna very carefully hold this in place and I'm going to staple it. We could use pins, but pins are not nearly as reliable. The staples really keep this down where it needs to be. So, and you'll notice that I stapled backwards. That's because in a minute I will pull those staples out. They're literally just for positioning. They're just more reliable than pins. Um, trying to pin through canvas is not really something you want to do. Then I'm going to also grab my great big huge tool of glue. In fact, actually, I'm realizing on the shelf I have a smaller one. I'm going to grab a smaller one because it's really hard to work with a really big spool of glue when you're just doing cuffs. So, okay, let's see. I'm going to leave my light off because of the video. So that feels awkward to me. So bear with me. Um, oh, a note about machines. Those of you who are curious, because I do get asked this a lot. What kind of sewing machine do you have to have to make vestments? And I just have, I've had this Juki Industrial. It's a really early model DDL 227 Juki. It's cast iron head, and it only goes forward and backward. There are no specialty stitches, and I can sew literally everything I make on this machine, with the exception of the scallop stitching detailing that is on cassocks. And that I have to do on a home machine. So here we go. Now I'm going to start my galoon on the, on the section of the cuff that does not have a ring, that top section that's missing a ring. And I'm going to start like this and I'm going to lay over a little bit of it. Okay. And I'm going to start a little ways in. Now, while I have this, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have at the ready is a used machine needle. This is a dulled machine needle. Um, those of you who are wondering, I sew usually with a 12 or a 14. It kind of depends on what fabric I'm, what I have in the machine and what I'm working on. Usually a 14 because I need it to go through all those layers. So I have this at the ready because I am going to use it to help me put in little kind of micro pleating as I go along. Oh, and I can feel right now, I can feel my first staple and I stapled in a little too close to my galoon. So right now I'm gonna take that staple out so that I don't run over it with my machine. That is one thing about industrial machines is you have to be extremely careful not to run over pins 
or staples with them because it can throw the timing and it's it's just kind of a nightmare when that happens. Okay, so now I'm coming up against here. Now, I'm gonna put in a false miter, but I need that false miter to actually go a little bit beyond the cuff. And I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. And I can actually see I've got another staple that's a little far out. So I'm gonna take that staple out too. Okay. I'm gonna make this miter come out a little bit here. And you'll see why in a minute. You'll notice that I'm almost entirely covering up the cuff ring, but I'll show you why in a second here. And then I'm going to use my flywheel to very carefully set that stitch and turn my corner. It's really important that all my rings are out and I can see them because again, I don't want to run over them. And I'm also pushing back my miter to make sure that my miter stays there nice and tight. And this part I'm going just really carefully and slowly. And down here I'm getting, I'm setting up for another miter, false miter. Well, actually, I'm sorry, that's a true miter. A false miter is when you actually, you'll see, we'll do one of those at the end, but a false miter is when you, you make a miter with two cut pieces of fabric. And again, I'm pushing that out, and now here, here, my outer edge is more curved than my inner, so I have to put in some little ease pleats. I want them really tiny, and also, I'm very aware of that staple that I put there. And I'm like, okay, this one I'm gonna be okay with. So I'm putting in these very tiny little ease pleats. They're really tiny. They're like some of the, okay, that one's like maybe a 16th of an inch, but some of them are really tiny, like a 32nd of an inch. But it just allows that galoon to curve. And a lot of those ease pleats just actually disappear. Once we iron them for the first time, they just sort of, that's how they work. They just sort of disappear once you put um, steam to them. Okay, now I know that this staple is going to definitely be in my way, so I'm going to remove that one too. Oh, and a note about thread, now that I noticed it. Um... I put gold in my top bobbin and I have burgundy in the bottom side because my lining is burgundy. So I just set up for that at the very beginning. Oh, and I'm trimming threads because I don't want to accidentally run over them. And I am very particular when I make vestments that I trim threads top to bottom. Um, those of you who sew, um, you may have been taught to just pull out the threads and snip them. It's not a very professional look. I really like the threads to be extremely um, trimmed very carefully, front and back trimming. Okay. So here we go. Okay, now I'm coming around and I'm gonna very carefully use my flywheel to get that one stitch over the other layer of glue. Right? I'm winding off. Oh, and those of you who are wondering how I'm making this go up and down, for those of you who've never seen an industrial machine, I've got a knee pedal down here. And so that allows, it keeps my hands free and allows me to actually raise and lower the presser foot. That's actually one of the primary reasons like you wanna get an industrial machine. Okay, I'm trimming my glue in. I'm setting my glue out of the way because I don't need it now. I would need, and normally I would be doing this two cuffs at the same time. Now at this point, I'm gonna turn it over and remove any last staples that I don't have and put my staple remover away because I'm done with it. Now I'm gonna take my cross, I'm gonna turn off the machine, I'm gonna take my cross and I'm gonna head here now to the ironing board. And here, I'm getting ready to set up for my cross, but what I'm doing here is I am putting in my miters, I'm pressing those in. Okay, and those of you who are wondering about my iron, it is a high steam iron. Um, it's what a lot of professionals like me who just, you know, we don't have like a huge sewing workshop, but like we do a lot of sewing, we use a high steam. It, because the boiler chamber can go for about eight hours on a single filling of water, which is really helpful, and it doesn't ever like turn off. Those new irons with the automatic shut off are just so annoying. So now I'm making a false miter. I'm not gonna go into a huge detail about how I make a false miter right here because the next video coming up will be the how to sew a proskinatarian video. And that one, I'll go into more detail because that one will actually be a how-to video. And I'll talk about that. Now the biggest thing here, you gotta be careful. You can see my arm puts out a lot of steam and you've gotta be really careful not to burn yourself. Okay, so now I'm gonna come back. I brought my crossover, I don't know why I did that. I didn't really need it yet. And I am now going to stitch my miters independently. What that means is I'm going to pull them away from the cuff and I'm going to line up that outer edge. This is kind of tricky. Okay. And get that in there. And I am pulling all the layers away except for the balloon. And I'm doing that. And I'm going to do that on all four of these. And again, notice how I am trimming front and back, people. Front and back. No ugly tails. It just looks so... It just, it just looks messy. I don't like that look. So, okay. 
coming around to this one, I'm pulling the whole cuff away. I'm getting in there and sewing that. There we go. It's a lot of like little fussy little seams here to do this. And it's important too that you have really sharp little snips. We are really picky in the workshop about our, our five inch snips that sit near our machines. These ones, I had a lot of trouble getting them. They're from Germany. They're called, I think, Doro. But I really like them, I have to say. they are, And they are not cheap, but I will tell you, they're awesome for this kind of really fussy work. Okay, so now I have all four machine, uh, sorry, four miters sewn, one false and three real. Now I need to set my cross. Now, these crosses that we get have a little adhesive backing on them. Very convenient, it's really nice actually. They have this little adhesive backing, so they're kind of like peel and stick crosses. Now, I have seen some lesser quality vestments where someone obviously peeled and stuck and then never stitched them down. So don't ever make that mistake. You always have to stitch these down. The adhesive is simply for the sewing process. Okay, and I'm lining this all up, making sure that I'm all lined up here. Now, the really important thing here that I'm doing is I'm setting my machine stitch length way down. That's really critical when you sew crosses because there's this little section here. I'm actually gonna be sewing kind of right in here that little section is called a steek, it's S-T-I-K-H, a steek. And you've gotta get in there and make a lot of tight turns and you just cannot do that if your stitches are too big. So it's so funny, I've had a number of seamstresses that I've worked with over the years that when I show them that, they're like, oh, that's how you do it. I'm like, yeah, that's how you do it. You literally just turn the stitch link down. And you'll notice on this, okay, there's little pearls on this cross and I, oh, I have to say, I kinda of go in fear of those little pearls because they want to snap off, especially on an industrial machine, because the industrial machine just, it, it sews with such force. So on this, there was no way I would ever do this, actually like with my um, pedal. I would, I always, I have been sewing vestments for 25 years, and I would never dream of doing a cross like full power. I still have to do this and walk this all the way around very carefully, and I'm doing it entirely with the flywheel. So I'm literally, essentially, I am hand stitching with my with my um, sewing machine. And we've got to go all the way around that. But that's how you make those little invisible stitches and how those crosses look. It's actually one of those small things. I mean, those of you who kind of want to be little, you know, vestment connoisseurs, it's one of the things you can look for on a set of vestments. And you know whether it's well made is look and see how this, how the crosses were stitched. Whoops, now there my presser foot got away from me and see that's what I just don't want. Because I'm actually like moving my presser foot a couple, you know, just a sixteenth of an inch here, an eighth of an inch here, just to make sure I stay in that design. So that you don't see oops, and I just heard a slight little crunch. Okay, good, I didn't lose a bead. I tell ya. I mean the beads and the little sequins and stuff really are great on the crosses because they 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 Oops, and I heard another one. Oh, and I did crack a bead. Okay, so when I get all the way done, I'll probably have to re-sew that bead on. I'll have to see how bad the damage is. Okay. Oh, you know what? I think I'm okay on that one. <sighs> I'm okay on that one. Oh, yay, yay. It was actually, yep, it was not, it was not an important bead. Yay. Okay, good. Okay. And I'm going around this way. Yep, I apologize. This one just this just takes time. You had to try doing this on a felonian. Wow, on the eight inch crosses on the back of a felonian, it just takes a whole lot of time. And then any sort of cross that has like a lot of starbursts or other little shapes, it can take, gosh, it can take 20 to 30 minutes to actually sew the cross on the back of a felonian because you just have to very carefully walk this around. Okay. This is when having a knee pedal on your machine is awesome. 
because this is a little challenging to do on a home machine. The other thing you'll notice about my industrial machine is I have a very large hoop. This area here is called a hoop, and that is very, very helpful for vestments. Um, it can be very challenging to try and fit big swaths of liturgical brocade into a that smaller hoop of a home machine. So that's another reason that someone would get a um, an industrial machine. And also the whole flat table. The way the machine is set in, I'm not having to go up and over like you do on a sewing machine. But having said that, I did my entire apprenticeship, the first six months of my apprenticeship, without an industrial machine. So it's not like you absolutely have to have one. It just can be really nice down the road. Okay. So now my cuff is all sewn together here. Oh, I'm just going to like, okay. Okay, great. So my cuff is sewn in. Now I'm going to set the lining. And so we're going to go back over to the ironing board. Now here, what I'm going to do is I need my ruler and let's hope that my daughter left me a white pen. Oh, she did. Yay. Now here I'm going to mark the seam allowance for the lining just on one side, on the sides. Because this is a little, the way we do the cuffs is a little bit different. Now, in one of the, in one of the videos I did, I think I mentioned how we use a wraparound lining technique for, um, for vestments. Well, we are going to do that top and bottom, but the problem is once you put this here, you can't wrap around, um, let's see, I've got to go in farther. Actually, the more I think about this, I'm going to go in just a little farther. I just checked this. We, do, we give ourselves a little extra because you don't want to get to this point and not have enough. So let's see here. This one's going to have to go in farther. Okay, so this one's going to go in quite a bit more on this side. The problem is that we have to fold this down because we can't wrap it around because otherwise we would sew the cuffs in. And then the cuffs would not be, uh, sorry, the rings. We'd sew the rings in. So I'm going to lay this on here like that and see how I did. Okay. Oh, actually, there's a spot here where I feel like I could... I'm just going to kind of fuss with this a minute. Actually, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do now is now I will pin... Actually, hang on here. I will take and pin it here like this. We don't use a lot of pins investment sewing, but there are a few places like this that we do. So we're going to go like that and pin there. And now... Oh, actually, you know what? I feel like I'm a little crooked there. I'm going to move that up just a smidge. There we go. Okay. And pin that. Now, he, up here, I am going to do the wraparound lining technique. And so here, I'm going to take the lining, and I'm going to fold it very carefully over the canvas. And I'm using that canvas as a, as a um, firm edge with which to kind of place, position the lining. And I'm seeing here that this one doesn't want to wrap real easily. So I'm going to give it a few little, um, I'm going to put a few little snips in like this to kind of give it a little bit more play in there. There we go. That'll get it in there just a little tighter, a little cleaner, a little smoother. There we go. That's all I needed to do. Now, the polyester lining that I use, I absolutely love it. It's incredibly durable. It's really awesome stuff, but it does not press very well. And that's one of the things we don't like about it. Everything else we love about it. But the not pressing part is not a whole lot of fun. Now, very carefully, I'm moving this very carefully because everything's kind of tight and positioned in, and I'm, like, wanting to be really careful how I move things at this point. Now, I'm going to do the bottom edge. And I'm seeing there already that, like, okay, I might have some issues at my corner, but a lot of those issues I'm going to just work out at the machine. So here again, I'm very, ouch, very, trying not to poke myself. Very carefully setting that bottom edge, that lining. And some of this I'll fuss with again at the machine, but I'm gonna, I, I want to do as much setup work here as I possibly can. And that one also I'm going to pin in place. You'll notice that a little bit of the lining actually extends beyond, and that's okay. I actually like it to look like that because it, it means that the lining will take the abuse and not the brocade or the glue. And linings are actually inexpensive to replace. Now, I've already prepped my cords. I um, use a product called Freycheck. I think most of you who sew are familiar with this product, Freycheck. We have to use it on the cuff cords, and I already prepped those a while ago, so I'll just put one of those here. Now, I'm going to go and sew around the whole perimeter of the cuff and finish the cuff. 
but I need to make sure that that cord doesn't inadvertently fray in the inside of the cuff over years and years and years of use. So we put the fray check on there. It's essentially a glue that um, keeps that from coming apart because this would otherwise just kind of come apart and it would slip through the stitches. And that's not where we want to, we do not want that to happen. Now, at this point in time, I'm also having to st stitch down, I have to stitch down my miters that, that I made. Um, and so, because I never stitched those to the cuff. So we'll use that as a, as a means to set the cord and reinforce the cuff all the way around. Cause I'm gonna actually stitch over those miter lines. And right here, I'm gonna get in here a little tighter. Okay, great. And I'm gonna start here. And I wanna make sure that this cuff cord comes out correspondingly to the other side. So I'm gonna stitch that right here. Oh, and you know what? Right now I remember, it's right, always right now that I remember, whoops, I'm still on the small stitches for the crosses. So I have to set the stitch length back out. And I'm, I'm very careful. My machine is kind of, um, I love her, She's but she doesn't like a lot of um, heavy, heavy layers. So on areas like that, I oftentimes will have to kind of fuss with her a little bit and kind of get her to, I just have to kind of use the flywheel a little bit more. Now, I'm gonna start sewing around the perimeter like this, there we go. Now here I am putting in some little ease pleats, again, so that I don't get to the end and have a wad of glue at the other end. So I'm kind of watching for this and I'm like, okay, I gotta get a little bit more easing in here. This needs a little bit more. I need probably a good size little pleat right there. And sure enough, I did. Now I'm stitching around. Now I'm holding this here, stitching around. Now, here comes the fun part. <laughs> the fun part of cuffs is making sure that you don't damage your machine when you're sewing over the cuff rings. So here I'm gonna go completely flywheel. This is like, I am being very careful. I'm literally actually skipping over the, the metal of the cuff rings and I'm very careful. You can see I'm like, even with my flywheel, I'm not just crashing it down. I'm very, very carefully going to the next ring. Okay, and then I'm feeling for where that ring is because trust me, a broken needle at this point is just no fun. Actually, a broken needle is never fun. And in an industrial, if you go too fast, that broken needle can actually be kind of dangerous. It's like, it's a good idea to sew with glasses on if you have an industrial machine. Okay, great, there we go. Okay, so you can see here, I'm just very carefully feeling for where those rings are. Doing this all pretty much again by hand, but you know, just with the flywheel. Okay, now I'm out at the very corner and here, I'm gonna just keep going around. And let's see here, I'm gonna keep going around. Now here I can go back to using the, the presser foot. And I'm gonna very carefully here. Now here, most of my pleating was in here. So out here, I don't really need a lot of work. I just am starting to watch for that corner. You always kinda of have to be, with vestments, you always have to be watching for where's the next corner because that's where everything can just fall off the tracks. You gotta be really careful that you're really managing the glue well all the way along. like. It's, it's really pretty much inch by inch with Galoon because it's flexible and it flexes at a different rate than the fabric. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm coming this way and now I'm getting close enough to that cuff that I'm back to flywheel in it because I do not want to run over my, um, you know, I don't want to run over that cuff. Okay, so we're almost done. Here we go. Oh, and here I'm also, at this point, I'm taking any loose threads out of the way because it's kind of a pain to sew over those threads, your starting threads, okay, here we go. Okay, now, if I was sewing a, a set of vestments, an entire set of vestments, I always like to kind of warm up with the smaller pieces. So if it was me and I was sewing a set of vestments at this point, I would have actually been doing both of the cuffs in tandem. I would do everything with them together. They both go with me to the ironing board, they both come back, and I finish them this way. Oh, you'll notice too here that I'm not back tacking. Um, we very rarely back tack. Those of you who sew, that's where you run the machine and then you run it back over itself. We almost never do that in sewing because it creates this sort of gob of stitches. It's not very nice looking. What we tend to do much more is what's called blending, which is where we sew and then we sew back over a seam line. It's just a lot more attractive. Okay, so now I'm closing those out like that, or I'm just trimming them out, here we go. I'm trimming this out. Okay, and then here is my finished cut. Now, oh, and I see a thread there. Okay, but it's not attached. And then something very important that we always do in vestments, 
is we set everything with the, at the iron. Everything needs to be set. All of that balloon, all of those ease cleats, everything needs to be, I would say, mash it. Like it needs to be pretty well mashed. Now, because it just sets everything. Now on the back side, you can see that we went over, here's our line where we set the cord. And then we went all the way around very carefully, skipping over those cuff rings. Because the cuff rings are already sewn in there with the hand stitching, the top stitching that I already did. So this is just to purely close the galloon and the lining together. And then we came around this way, came around this way, boom. And you'll see, especially like up here where that cording is a little tight, I probably actually could have gotten this a little bit cleaner in this area. Um, if, I, if I was actually working on this for a client, I would probably go back and pull that out and make that just a smidge cleaner. But here we are, here's our cuff. Now we're gonna lace it. Now this one, I always have to say the little thing to me. Inside, outside, okay, inside, outside, okay. Inside, outside. I've had to do this for the whole 25 years I've been making vestments, okay. Outside, okay. Inside. Whoopsie, and already my cuff cord, even though it's fray checked, is starting to split. So we'll fix that in just a minute here. And then outside, okay, great. And then it goes through the last one. And sometimes I have to kind of pull the lining a little bit away to get that cording to go through. Now, now here we go. And what I tend to do is I tend to pull it this way so I know it's like nice and set this way and it, the cuff cord isn't getting twisted or anything. And then we pull that all the way through. And then very gently, we kind of give it a little hand press this way. I don't tend to like press this with the, with the iron because I don't really want to set permanent creases in there. But there we go. And there's a set of cuffs. And then we would put it this way, secure it that way. Oh, one thing I forgot we would do is tie the knot in the end, the cords. That keeps the cord from fraying anymore, but it also, and we pull it pretty tight, it keeps it from popping back through the ring. So that's a set of, that's one of a set of cuffs. I wanna thank you for joining me today and remind you that this video has been sponsored by the Calvin Institute for Christian Worship and the Liturgical Arts Academy. If you enjoyed this, stay tuned. I'll be doing another video on how to sew a pro skinitarian cover, an icon stand cover, and that one will actually be a, a full how-to video. Just to remind you, I'm Krista West, and if you would like to see my work, you can see my vestment work at www.kwvestments.com, or if you'd like to see my folk embroidery work, you can see that at www.avlea, that's A-V-L-E-A dot life. Thank you.